Ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Edward Byrne. I'm the president and principal of King's College London. Uh, welcome to this splendid occasion, the 27th annual Runciman Lecture. Uh, tonight, we're especially privileged because the lecture will be given uh, by Professor Emerita Charlotte Roucher uh, of King's College London. Uh, the lecture has been from the onset uh, sponsored by the late Nicholas Egon and Matty Egon. And this year's lecture is, of course, appropriately dedicated to the memory of Nicholas. It was the inspiration of the artist and benefactor, Nicholas Egon, 27 years ago to establish an annual lecture at King's named after his good friend, the historian of Byzantium and the Crusades, Stephen Runciman. Nicholas, who passed away last year at the age of 95, was the first patron of our newly created Center for Hellenic Studies. During those 27 years, Nicholas and his wife, Matty, and Matty, it's wonderful to have you here tonight, um, became good friends of successive principals of Kings and of many of our colleagues and supporters here tonight. Sadly, this will be the first Runciman Lecture when Nicholas has not been with us. Two days ago at the Brompton Oratory, many in this audience came together to commemorate the life of this remarkable man in a religious setting. With Matty's permission, we would like to think of this first Runciman Lecture without him as his secular memorial. And so we have decided to, get to, to dedicate this evening to the memory of our dear friend, Nicholas Egon. Of course, these lectures also commemorate Sir Stephen Runciman, who was a, re who was a regular uh, attender until his death in 2000, just short of his centenary. What Nicholas especially admired about Stephen Runciman as a historian was the combination of rigorous scholarship, the willingness to challenge prevailing assumptions, the flair and indeed lucidity of his literary style and his ability to communicate with audiences reaching far beyond the traditional academy. And in turn, we at King's hope to encourage those qualities in our students and in future generations of historians through the example of the Runciman Lectures. Runciman Lectures at King's have historically covered a wide range of topics including many different aspects of the Hellenic world from prehistory to the present day. And a special focus has been on the interaction between the Greeks and the lands and peoples further east, a topic beloved of Runciman and also of Nicholas, the painter of many Middle Eastern landscapes, especially in Jordan. Tonight's lecture will take us into some of those same landscapes and tackle head on some of the big questions about the Greek world and the Levant that have set people thinking ever since the time of Herodotus. And now it is time for me to hand over to Professor Dame Avril Cameron, who will introduce both the lecture and the lecturer. Professor Cameron, before she left King's to become warden of Keeble College, Oxford, was our first professor of late antique and Byzantine studies and the founding director of the Center for Hellenic Studies. It was she who first worked with Nicholas and Marie Egon to establish this great series of lectures. So it is particularly appropriate that she should introduce tonight's speaker, our most recently retired professor uh, of late antique and Byzantine studies uh, and a great friend uh, to, to us all. After the lecture, the vote of thanks will be given by Professor Judith Heron, who succeeded Avril in the, in the same chair and is director uh, of our Center uh, of Hellenic Studies for almost 10 years and who also worked closely with Nicholas and Matty. Uh, so now, without further ado, can I invite uh, Dame Avril Cameron to introduce the lecture and the lecturer. I can't start without some words about Nicholas. It seems very strange that after so many years of Runciman <coughs> lectures, Nicholas Egon should not be with us. He became a strong supporter of the center very soon after its foundation in 1989. And he was the moving spirit behind the Runciman lecture from the very beginning. <laughs> 
This year's lecture is incredibly the 27th in a long series. With his own cosmopolitan background and his interests, Nicholas wanted the lectures to be broader in scope than the term Hellenic studies might suggest. And he was especially interested in subjects that spanned both the Greek and Byzantine worlds and the Eastern Mediterranean and the near, or as it's nowadays called, the Middle East. He was interested in chronological as well as geographical and cultural breadth. And it was his idea to name the lecture after the iconic Byzantine historian Stephen Runciman. Runciman, the tall figure of Runciman, was a regular presence, making the journey from the Scottish borders to the Athenaeum and walking to Kings. Nicholas loved bringing his friends and connections to the lectures. And for nearly 30 years, they have attracted a huge crowd, like tonight, of specialists and interested people, exactly what's now known as outreach. It's a wonderful pleasure to see Matty Egon tonight and to, sh to know that she shares all this and continues the tradition. She's a classicist and a Hellenist in her own right, and she brought another annual event to King's, the Greek Archaeological Committee Lecture. Nicholas sadly died after the last Runciman lecture, which I myself had to miss. And we remember him with love, with affection and immense gratitude. And we extend our deep sympathy to Matty and our warm thanks for tonight. To turn to our lecturer, Charlotte Richet, Professor Charlotte Richet joined King's in 1985 as the first lecturer in Byzantine literature at a time when there was no such post in a British university. Those were early days. The centre itself was not founded until 1989, but the college was already keen to develop the connections between classics, history, and Byzantine and modern Greek. Charlotte's range is as wide as Nicholas could have desired. In 1989, the year of the foundation of the Centre for Hellenic Studies, she published the Greek inscriptions of the stunning late antique and early Byzantine site, now in Turkey, of Aphrodisias. Aphrodisias was a prosperous Greek city adorned with an array of public buildings and statues honouring local figures and the Roman imperial hierarchy. And its inscriptions, often in Greek verse written under the Roman Empire, are a window into the cultural life of the time, and especially of Greek cities in the Roman Empire. The reach of Hellenic studies. Charlotte has taken a prominent role in the centre. She's been the director, and she played a vital role in building up the <coughs> teaching of late antiquity and Byzantium at King's, including Greek language teaching, classical and Byzantine. She's published several other important studies of aphrodisias and related subjects, and she's been, since the 1990s, a pioneer in the field of digital humanities, in which King's excels. In 2013, she published an online edition, translation and commentary on the 11th century Byzantine writer Kekabmenos completing a task, as I think she will tell you, begun by her own grandmother, Georgina Butler, but in a completely new way, making full use of the possibilities now available in the field of Byzantine studies through digital research and resources. She's the current chair of the online biographical prosopography of the Byzantine world, another major digital research project in which Kings is a pioneer. These are only some of Charlotte's achievements. There are many others. For instance, an online publication relating to the Sacra Parallela of John of Damascus. And she's greatly in demand. She's always on a plane somewhere. She's greatly in demand at digital humanities conferences and meetings all over the world, pursuing that holy grail of digital research, a unifying system to link up all the separate research <coughs> projects. She's given us an expansive title for tonight's lecture, and it's one that chimes beautifully with the aims of the Runciman Lecture when Nicholas and I first set it up. It also expresses the scope of the Centre for Hellenic Studies, 
running as it does from classical Greece to the present and always looking outwards. Her title is Seeing the Levant from Herodotus to the Present Day. It could not be more appropriate as an expression of the breadth and range of Hellenic studies itself. Charlotte. This is a bittersweet occasion. My last proper conversation with Nicholas was last February, when he asked me to give this year's lecture. It is very strange not to see him smiling in the front row. It is a huge honour to have the chance to celebrate him this evening. Nicholas loved people and parties, and I hope to bring many people to today's party. Above all, I want to remind us of Nicholas's work. You've been looking at this picture well, as you came in. These images do not meet our normal expectations. The first was from Jordan, the second is from Saudi Arabia. These are not the conventional pictures that are conjured up in your mind when you hear the names of these countries. They can perhaps serve to highlight how difficult we find it to adjust our preconceptions. One of the core tasks of a university is to challenge and test preconceptions in the Socratic tradition. But universities are shape changers, responding to national and international influences, developments in society, politics, the economy. The Kings of 2018 is different in many ways from the Kings of 1989, when the Center for Hellenic Studies was established. In such complex and dynamic institutions, there is a constant tension between the call to new frontiers and the continued understanding of rich traditions. One important thread in the tapestry is provided by established chairs in particular areas. The Karais chair is an excellent example of this, and the recent re-endowment of the chair, through the work of many generous friends, is a remarkable and important achievement. Another such thread can be provided by established lectures. Nicholas's generous endowment of the Runciman Lecture will ensure that this particular tradition continues. Another established lecture series at King's reflects the fact that institutions don't always get it right. Again and again, at all universities, including King's, Individual insights outrun institutional understanding. The Morris Lectures in the Department of, of Theology and Religious Studies commemorate an important 19th century theologian and social activist, F.D. Morris, who was forced to resign from King's in 1853 when his ideas for social reform seemed too threatening. The lectures were established in 1933, a little later, by which time society had caught up with him. One important and particularly subversive part of Morris's work was in encouraging the education of women, something we're thinking about a lot this year, and indeed even this week and next week. Women always matter as Judith Herrin has pointed out on many occasions. They matter when they're rulers, and as Nicholas also knew. knew. Um, educating them has dramatic effects, as Matty, among others, has demonstrated. And that photograph, I think, was taken in this room uh, last year last autumn. The 
number, the proportion of women is fairly high. <laughs> Morris was a leading light in the establishment of the Girls' Public Day School Trust. The Trust's second school, Notting Hill High School, was opened in 1873. The thing about education, as all of us who teach know, is that you can never be sure what you have started. You can only be sure that the outcomes will be unexpected. In 1885, the year of this, this uh, uh, magazine, three girls found themselves in the same class of 16-year-olds at the Notting Hill High School. They were Una Ridgway, the daughter of the local vicar, Hilda Stevenson, the daughter of an MP, and Georgina Walrand, the daughter of a civil servant. The three all became and remained friends, and their lives were interwoven with one another and with us today. Una was to marry Ronald Burroughs, who became the principal of King's. I've not been able to find a photograph of Una, very frustratingly. Um, Hilda was to marry Walter Runciman. She was briefly an MP in her own right, and she was the mother of Stephen. Georgina was to develop an interest in Byzantium and to write a study of Anna Comnena. She was also my grandmother, and she started the work on Kekavmenos, which I was able to bring to fruition in a slightly different medium. Uh, the interest for us is that all these women, so coincidentally brought together, uh, were to participate in the discovery of an, a post-classical Hellenic world. What they could achieve as women was limited by the period into which they were born. But they still achieved a great deal and have their place in the long journey which has brought us to where we are today. Hilda and Georgina both went to Girton, where they both served in the fire brigade, uh, which was trained by the head of the London fire brigade, Captain Shaw, who is uh, commemorated, you may remember, in Iolanthe. There's an entire, there's an aria to Captain Shaw. Captain Shaw came and trained the Girton Fire Brigade. They both achieved first-class awards, although not degrees, since those were not yet granted to women. Georgina married an American in 1892 and moved with her husband to the USA. Una married Ronald Burroughs in the early 1890s. Again, I haven't been able to find the exact date. And in 1898, Hilda married Walter Runciman, and Stephen was born in 1903. I'm lucky to have my grandmother's diaries from school and from university. She fell passionately in love with Greek language and literature, so that there's a great deal that we can share with her. This group of girls, as I've said, were in a significant generation who were about to develop a new and wider relationship with Hellenic culture. They were already aware of Greek material culture. The great collections of the museums offered them some access. For example, lectures and presentations at what we know as the v &A, the South Kensington Museum, uh, to which my grandmother was taken very excited by the lectures that she heard from Jane Harrison. But the lands described in the literature were still very remote. It was only in the year after they met, in 1886, that the British School at Athens was founded. The same year saw the first of Thomas Cook's Nile cruises. Travel east of Italy remained difficult and expensive for another century. It is really difficult to recall in this easyJet age quite how distant Greece was, let alone the lands to the east. Photography was still rare, understanding still rested first and foremost on written texts. We are so flooded with images that we have to make a real effort to imagine a world where knowledge had to be formed without them. 
I tried teaching a class that way, once that way, asking them to describe things without drawing pictures and without using their hands. It's not easy. The only way to process, process the resultant understandings tends to be by simplification. Until the middle of the 20th century, there were two principal frameworks for people in Western Europe to imagine the Middle East, the texts in the Bible and the literature of classical Athens. Many more educated people in Western Europe knew that literature than had any knowledge of the world east of the Greek peninsula. The situation was further complicated by the victories of Alexander and the spread of Greek culture and language. In building an educational system that would ensure that Greek, in use across the whole of the Levant, did not fragment, the educators of the Hellenistic period drew up a curriculum which would remain in use for almost 2,000 years. The canon of authors to be studied were the writers of 5th and 4th century Athens, and good writing should avoid the use of new vocabulary. This policy conserved the language very effectively, contrast the evolution and fragmentation of Romance languages in Western Europe. But one area of maximum confusion was created by using the language of 5th century Athens to refer to foreign peoples. Everyone in the north was a Scythian, everyone in the east was a Persian. The conventions of the popular theatre in the Greco-Roman world reflected this. Everyone in the, in the east looked like that. If you saw an actor come on dressed like that, you knew what he was representing. Um, he's dressed as a typical Persian. He's almost certainly, given that he's carrying a fish, almost certainly a representation of Tobias from the Old Testament. The audience did not require any more specific or authentic identification. The sophisticated Byzantine writer and his audience understood this perfectly well. His or her audience, I should say. Um, the Byzantines observed and studied the variety of their neighbours, as we know from the De Administrando Imperio, that was first published in the West in 1611. Western scholars could have learnt a great deal from this and other Byzantine sources, but most of them were more interested in literary and theological texts and continued to work with a very simplified framework. A perfect example of this was provided for me my, by my colleague Edith Hall. Um, an 18th century representation of the 19th century representation of the Battle of Marathon shows the Persians dressed as Turks. That's what people wear east of Greece. That's, that's how they are. There is a fixed model. The Levant of the early modern period, therefore, was understood as a place unchanged since antiquity, where the threats were the same as those confronting Greece in the fifth century. The fact that the countries were very difficult to visit, of course, may help to perpetuate this understanding. This is the world which allowed the sloppy shorthand of Orientalism, which, as Averill Cameron pointed out many years ago, in a very important lecture, her inaugural, her second inaugural, um, was also applied to Byzantium. Um, these attitudes provide an excuse for lazy thinking and ignorance. Habits which are still widely prevalent to our cost. And if there's anywhere that has a job of fighting lazy thinking, it has to be the university much to the regret of our students sometimes. <laughs> um, I'm no good with bits of paper. Images ought to help break this down. But when Western artists travelled to the Levant to record what they saw in the early period, they were liable to concentrate on the recognisable, which meant the classical, with the local colour simply added at the edges. Indeed, they were sometimes commissioned that's what they'd been sent to do, to rediscover the classical past. The, the classical past and present it looking the way you want it to look. The achievements of such travellers were appropriately celebrated. Uh, this is Robert Wood and James Dawkins, his companion on that trip, 
They are suitably adorned as cl in classical gear. They are new Romans discovering the East, surrounded by appropriate Eastern figures. The types around and the pure, the people who understand the spirit of pure classicism in the middle, in the middle, in the center. This is very different from Nicholas. <laughs> um, the very opposite, really, of presenting yourself as the external classicizing figure. This is Nicholas in 1966 adapting to his environment. This image here, this typical image of Petra, has a few uh, decorative, decorative locals in the front, but it has a function, really, of reporting what is there. And that, after all, is you've traveled all this way to a very difficult and inaccessible place. You're trying to give a, 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 an academic, in some ways, record of what it is you see. Uh, you're reporting what is there and what most people could never hope to see. Nicholas's Petra is very different. It's full, it's in a landscape. It belongs within a, a place. It's not an archaeological report. Um, similarly, if you look at the... Um, ancient, the temple at Pella in Jordan. Again, this is folded into its landscape, in no way documented for antiquarian purposes. And in Greece, indeed in Greece, he didn't paint, I uh, haven't seen very many paintings of antiquities. They're paintings of Greece. Nicholas drew and painted what he saw, not what he thought he ought to see. His very earliest engagement uh, with the Middle East was when he was uh, stationed in Basra during the Second World War. Um, he revisited Basra. I'd thought that this painting might have been done at that time, but I've had it confirmed to me that it's actually from a trip in, with a friend in 1970. Um, quite a, a very limited color, color range compared to some of his other paintings. Uh, one of the striking things is his range. But again, he evokes the place as he actually saw it. But for the, for the educated classes, and even the less educated classes, it was n the, the country itself was not evoked. Even more people knew the world through the text of the Bible. And in 1925, Lloyd George could write that he knew much more of the history of the kings of Judah than he did of the histories of kings of England, or even, he said, of Wales, where, of course, he was brought up. Um, the geography was that of the journeys of St. Paul, found in the back of many 19th century Bibles. This was the thought world with which people engaged, with, with, which, with which people were prepared when they engaged with the crisis of the First World War. The world, the war whose, with whose consequences we are still working through. A hundred years is not a very long time. When, as when war broke out, the first thing soldiers needed well, is what they always need, which is maps. And the journeys of St. Paul were not quite sufficient. By the end of the 19th century, the best and the most detailed maps of Asia Minor and the Levant were those drawn by an ancient historian, Heinrich Kiepert, who traveled extensively in Asia Minor, uh, recording principally with the concern of finding ancient sites and recording them. In the First World War, his maps were used by the German high command with the railways drawn in. Um, a few years ago, I went up to Aberdeen to work on the archives of an epigrapher there, 
a man called William Calder, uh, who travelled in uh, Asia Minor both before and after the First World War recording inscriptions. Um, and in his archives, I found copies of Keepert's maps stamped Tox, top secret and annotated in pen. Calder had been recruited to work with the British intelligence services during the war, hired, at, placed in Manchester Square, apparently where the Wallace Collection now is, was the headquarters of one of the intelligence bureaus. And they were working from Calder's archaeological maps pinned onto a table, you can still see the pinholes, and then annotated with useful information. So both sides in the war were working within a geography determined for, for them by archaeologists. I, but archaeologists were, of course, important in both the First World War and the Second because they actually knew the terrain and the people. The most famous, of course, is Lawrence. Um, and I find this very, that very pleasing, that image. But another example is Ronald Burroughs. Um, he first visited Greece in 1895 to carry out a survey at Pylos. He and his colleague Percy Yeo then excavated at Rizona. Both men were hugely excited by the steady revelation of more and more aspects of antiquity, particularly the discoveries in, at Knossos. Burroughs published a volume on the discoveries in Crete. And this was apparently an, an element in the fascination which both he and his colleague Yeo felt with Venizelos. Um, this is the a rather improbable address to the Classical Association in 1917, pointing out that the mission of Venizelos sent by Crete, by Crete to Greece is mirrored in the events 3,000 years uh, earlier, which have been revealed by English scholars and archaeologists. It's a beautiful circle. This is a culture we can appropriate. In, in 1901, Burroughs had considered applying for the chair of classics at King's. He's, he writes, it proved to be so badly paid that I could not afford to take it. Note. <laughs> But in 1913, he came to King's as principal. Um, he, was, he was therefore well placed to support Hellenic causes. The war found all our three women in London and in contact. Una was living at the principal's house, now long gone. Walter Runciman, Hilda's husband, was an MP and president of the Board of Trade until 1916. Georgina was working with the Red Cross inquiry for the wounded and missing, and her American husband, William Buckler, was acting as an American diplomat. Burroughs was extensively involved in all the efforts to draw Greece in on the Allied side, including the offer of Cyprus to Greece. Walter Runciman supplied information about shipping losses in the war to Buckler, who used the information in reports designed to encourage US entry into the war. Venizelos visited London in November 1917 and was welcomed at a reception at the Guildhall where the ushers were students from King's. And everybody, as you can see, was there. Well, I don't quite know why we didn't celebrate it last November uh, last November the 16th. Um, the war was far from over. Um, the struggle on the Macedonian front, which was yet to come, will be examined in a conference in May being organised in Athens by my colleague Michael Llewellyn, Llewellyn Smith. But Venizelos also gave an interview to the Morning Post. Um, in which he draws attention to something very glaring, which was the significance of the fact that in the April of that year, 
the USA had joined the war on the Allied side. We've spent the last three years marking the anniversaries of the First World War, and something which surprised me in April last year, or was perhaps the result of the modern political situation, was the relative silence over the centenary of the USA joining the war. President Trump marked it by attending the Bastille Day ceremonies. I haven't got a photograph. Um, the British government saw nothing odd in deploying archaeologists and other scholars in the war effort. Uh, the Arab Bureau in Cairo drew on David Hogarth and Gertrude Bell, as well as uh, Lawrence. But they also had an extensive and experienced foreign office, as well as the India office. And this is the photograph from which that earlier photograph was taken. Uh, Bell and Lawrence are just two among a big crowd of men in uniform and people who've got their own ideas as to what's going to happen. Uh, they both experienced enormous frustrations in the difficulty of expressing what they actually knew to the power brokers. And that's something that we've known about for Lawrence for some time and which has become much clearer about Bell through recent research. Um, the United States, however, had nothing, I particularly like this image uh, with the important people, including Venizelos, dotted around Wilson. Um, the United States had nothing on that, this, that scale. The State Department was still extremely small. It was therefore entirely in, in character that Woodrow Wilson favoured the idea of a group of experts, remember experts, providing advice directly to his personal advisor, Colonel House. And this was set up in summer 1917. To avoid public attention, this group was simply called the Inquiry, and it's avoided public attention so well that there are very few studies of them. There's one really good book, and written in the 60s, and very, very little else about them. Researchers were assigned to issues and to problem areas of which, not the Middle East, not the Levant, Western Asia was the largest section. In some areas of study, particularly Central Europe and the Balkans, there were many American communities with opinions to express. In the case of the Levant, however, there were many fewer voices and much less knowledge. You'll remember we have our doubts about experts, but Walter Lippmann certainly didn't. What we need is our own experts. What we are on the lookout for is genius, sheer startling genius, and nothing else will do. Well, that's one way of solving your diplomatic problems. Um, under a professor president, where do you look? You look to the universities. In the case of Western Asia, this had odd results. The two men who, leading figures from our point of view are the, the two heads of the inquiry were first Dana Munro, who qualified as having studied the Crusades, and William Westerman, who qualified because he was a papyrologist. Uh, another, the other classicist, an important man, is David McGee, who did have the rare qualification of actually having been to Syria, looking for inscriptions. Uh, why Dana Munro, the son, who was an expert on Latin America, aged 25, was in this group is the kind of thing that is less far from clear. The historian of the inquiry wrote, perhaps more than any other branch of the inquiry, this division illustrated how the inquiry's directorate selected men having special knowledge of ancient classical civilizations and placed on them full responsibility for studies involving contemporary history. Arthur Andrews was to recall the words with which uh, Archibald Coolidge, a professor from Harvard, ushered him into the inquiry. You know one Mohammedan from another. <laughs> the quality of distance is astonishing. The archaeologists, as we know, did have some first-hand knowledge of the countries concerned, and the most obvious example is Lawrence. And the gap between his understanding and that of others was revealed at the time, and at the Paris Peace Conference of 1919, and the drawing of maps. That is the famous Lawrence map, 
which is in the Imperial War Museum, and this is the famous Sykes-Picot map. And I have sometimes wondered whether there's much discussion of these maps, whether one aspect is the relative familiarity of one configuration rather than another in terms of what, you all, what you, you're used to, the pictures you're used to seeing, and the maps you're used to seeing. In 2019, we will mark the centenary of the Paris Peace Conference. It was a bit like Davos. Uh, there was this bizarre mixture of business people, diplomats, soldiers, and loads of academics, all milling around having lunch. Um, it lasted longer than Davos. It lasted about six months. Um, but they were all, people were trying to rebuild a shattered world, to build countries, but also to recreate international scholarship. The Union Académique Internationale was set up, and various other entities, including, in our field, Byzantion, and the Supplementum Ecographicum Graecum. They arrived, arrived directly from meetings at that point. There will be much discussion of the malign political results of that peace conference, but it's helpful to think about what they knew and what they didn't know. We may well complain about the ignorance of history by our politicians, but in the early 20th century, there was perhaps a tendency to go to the other extreme. They brought a confident historical understanding. They knew they knew. They were certain that they understood. The atmosphere is very well conveyed in Ernest Raymond's Tell England, an astonishing uh, novel then made into a successful film. There's a story, there's a picture of the colonel urging on the young men uh, in his troop. Uh, and he urges them to, in the assault on the Gallipoli, he's urging them on with these images from their classical reading at school. And as we, he spoke, we were schoolboys again and listened with wide open, wistful eyes. I can't quite imagine that in today's army, but perhaps that's what it's like. And the other line, he, there, the Gallipoli campaign is a new crusade, but unlike the other crusades, it's going to be led by the Church of England. Quite a remarkable expectation. It was, of course, Stephen Runciman who was going to present to a British audience a more nuanced picture of the Crusades. And against that background, you realize quite how startling that must have been, how his description of, was at will have broken, had to break through a huge body of assumptions and understandings. And he would explain the relevance of Byzantine history and Byzantine understandings to our understanding of the Levant. It's in Roddy's book that I came across Byron's essay on the Greeks, written in 1811 and describing a very similar mindset to that of a century later. Of the ancient Greeks we know more than enough, he actually says, at least the younger men of Europe devote much of their time to the study of the Greek writers and history, which would be more usefully spent in mastering their own. But importantly, he says, let us look at them as they are. Let us look at everyone as they are. Recent events have shown us that old attitudes have not disappeared. The knowledge of the classical past may have faded, but many of the other terrible simplifications live on. This precisely betrays what we should have learned from Herodotus, whose accounts of other cultures were full of complexity. He reported what he heard and saw and contributed to a civilization where everything was examined and questioned. At least modern scholarship, not least because of the influence of archaeology, tries to engage with him on his own terms. But one of the challenges for the modern scholar of the classical past is to shake off public memory of an ossified and isolated classicism. We are hugely empowered at King's by being able to study and teach the world of classical Greece within a long and ever-evolving tradition of Hellenism. We can try to observe each period in the true spirit of Herodotus, endeavoring to see what is really there, 
as artists do. Every scholar and every artist brings his or her own vision. Both Donald Nicol and Nicholas were in Greece in the late 1940s. Donald was, of course, the Corrie's professor before Roddy. Do Donald recorded Byzantine monuments while he was there. We are extremely lucky to have his sketchbooks, which have generously been given by his son, which offer a very valuable account of the Greece he saw. But it's interesting, Nicholas painted what he saw. He saw people, the land and its people. He didn't search out any monuments. I have a feeling that on this journey he may not have had his colours with him because they seem all to be drawings or uh, ink. Uh, the orphan, it's, this is a very appropriate image because the orphans of this period and their adoption are the subject of current research by our Corais professor-elect, Gonda Van Steen. In Byron's words, let us look at them as they are. The ancient past is hugely important and rich with delights for those of us lucky enough to study it, but none of us own it. The story that I have told reflects some of the ways in which it has been distorted or misused, but it is important to understand how this has shaped people's thought, even in very consequential matters. A core value of studying the classical world is because it commands our respect and is yet profoundly distant, different, and constantly changing as the evidence changes. The teaching of such a tradition enables us to teach our students how to engage with otherness without disrespect or scorn. They must constantly question their assumptions and themselves. Classical studies in the widest sense have always been valued at King's, and our colleague Edith Hall is currently conducting a campaign to embed the study of the classics in British schools. But we, staff, and stu staff students, and friends, are particularly fortunate in King at King's that we are able to look at the classical tradition over the centuries as part of a lived human experience. Whether it is the engagement of Cavafy with a Hellenistic world, or the transmission of medical knowledge between Byzantium and the Arabs, all subjects currently studied at King's, we are studying a conversation which is centuries long and a variety of people who have behaved in many different ways. We have a duty to ensure that that tradition continues to be presented in all its richness and complexity. We must teach our students to take the trouble to resist simplifications and to look. To look closely and carefully. And then engage with what they see. Not to see with anyone else's opinions. That is what the true artist does. He shows us what he sees. And that is one reason why we are so grateful to Nicholas. I think that's just wonderful. Thank you very much to Nicholas. Thank you.